ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, of, of course, Scott and Andrew for your kind introductions. And um, my special actual thanks to Scott for inviting me to give this lecture this evening. Like Scott, I'm also extraordinarily grateful to Trinity Western University for making this wonderful new facility available to CPC. Um, uh, it's another sort of example of the ecumenical atmosphere and attitude that kind of characterizes the relationship between CPC and TWU. It is a blessed uh, partnership that I certainly pray will continue and even to strengthen in the years to come. As has been advertised, and I will stick to abiding by the commitment to truth in advertising, this evening's lecture poses a question. I think uh, a fascinating and sometimes thorny question. Who, who, who has authority in the Catholic Church? Before your questions, the end of the lecture, my task is to lay the groundwork or the foundation upon which the answer to this question depends. We're talking this evening about teachers in the Catholic Church and teaching or magisterium, to use the Latin term, in this church. Like all Christians, Catholics hold that the gospel is their standard of belief. Gospel understood in the wide term, not in terms of the four gospels. We are hearers of the word of God to which we must all be submissive. Pope St. John XXIII entitled one of his papal writings, his encyclical, an encyclical, he called it Mater et Magistra. The church is both our mother, our mater, and our magister, our teacher. As a mother, the church nurtures us with the life of the sacraments. And as a teacher, she leads us to have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus our Lord and to fulfilling the law of Christ. Good mistress that she is, the church does more than offer vague doctrinal suggestions and moral encouragement to the faithful. She dares to teach the truth of Jesus Christ and to do so with authority. Despite Canadians, our innate dislike of being told what to do, our schools, our leaders of opinion, trumpeted by the social media, are in fact instructing or teaching us all the time. They are trying to cajole, persuade, and even manipulate us into believing what they tell us. They are in fact relentless, relentlessly teaching us about who we are, what we should be doing, and what the world should be like. And even if these teachers don't pontificate on the mystery of the Trinity, they do so glibly on other questions of more than marginal concern to Christians. What we think about what is often referred to as the big three, about money, sex, and power. Given the widespread spirit where people are supposed to maximize their independence or their freedom, many fail to see the need for teaching authority in the church. Frequently, they imagine that the church is a tyrannical and even a bossy mother who capriciously orders people about and in doing so corrupts the freedom that Christ came to offer for freedom, we have been set free. They don't want to be guided by an authority that they think makes up what are referred to as rules or doctrines just to keep discipline in the ranks. But the church, of course, makes no such claim. Her teaching comes from Christ, who gives the church the spirit of truth to guide her down through the centuries. I, for one, am very grateful that the church's teaching provides an alternative, a true voice, to the confusing chorus that is constantly shaping our religious and moral life. 
the foundation of Christianity lies in the authority of God who reveals himself, tells us, communicates himself, lies in that authority and the absolute truth of his word that he communicates to humankind through his son, Jesus Christ. And for his part, Jesus equipped the apostles to communicate, or as we've heard already explained, to tradition or to hand on to us God's plan of salvation as he revealed it, and to do so truthfully. He shared with them his own power and authority. To all of the apostles together, as well as to Peter alone on the road to Caesarea Philippi, Jesus said, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. He gave the apostles authority to teach others what they had received, what they themselves had been taught. And this included the power to discern between true and false teaching or doctrine, a power that was exercised extensively in the first Christian communities. So that the church can remain faithful to the original revelation, she must continue to have in her midst, even today, authorized witnesses to that foundational revelation, witnesses who are empowered to pass it on and to do so reliably, thanks to the Holy Spirit, thanks to the paraclete, it is, it is indeed possible for us, subsequent generations, to have the same experience of the Lord as the risen one, that experience that was had by the apostolic community at the origin of the church, since this original revelation is passed on and actualized, it becomes present, in the church's faith and worship. As far as we can determine, Jesus never explicitly mentioned the need for the apostles to have co-workers, let alone successors. Yet the apostles in the Great Commission were sent to make disciples, to make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything, Jesus says, that I have commanded you. This command of Christ clearly implies, of course, that others must teach and baptize even after the apostles had left the scene, after their death. These others whom we call now the Episcopoi, the bishops, succeed to that ministry first held by the apostles, that ministry of teaching the community, of teaching in the church. The authenticity of the original apostolic faith, in other words, that it remains substantially incorrupt from the time of the apostles, is preserved precisely through this succession of office. Though not eyewitnesses to Jesus' public ministry, and paschal ministry, and paschal mystery, bishops as successors to the apostles remain the guardians of the deposit of faith and responsible for handing it on. St. Paul's admonition to Timothy bears witness, and there are several, but this is one of the principal ones, bears witness to this obligation. Guard the good treasure entrusted to you with the help of the Holy Spirit living in us. We can affirm, therefore, that the Catholic Church, or Catholics, the Catholic Church believes and teaches that Christ, that Jesus Christ, delivered his revelation to the church and to the church as a corporate body, as the body of Christ. 
And having received the word of God, the church has the responsibility, one that it cannot surrender, to hand on this revelation, to explain it, and to defend it against errors. Pope Francis has put it this way, this magisterium, this teaching authority of the apostles' successors ensures, he says, our contact with the primor primordial source and thus provides the certainty of attaining to the word of God in all its integrity. The magisterium then guarantees that the people of God throughout time, that would be us, will always live guided and sustained by Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life. The Second Vatican Council, which met some 60 years ago now, clearly affirmed this in its document on the Word of God, De Verbum. And I quote, the duty of authentically interpreting the Word of God, whether written or handed down, has been given only to the living teaching office, the living teaching office, that is the magisterium of the church alone. Its authority in this manner is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ, the council's teaching in De Verbum 10. The bishops, and here I include the Bishop of Rome as well, don't teach with authority Certainly they don't do so because of their personal holiness or even their theological expertise. They do so as a collective body, which is often referred to as a college, a collegium, but it's just a collective body. And they receive a gift of the spirit to speak with authority. We're in the realm, of course, of supernatural realities, not politicians, who can adjust what people sometimes call their policies. They can't adjust these so-called policies to fit their followers' fancies. Bishops must faithfully hand on the deposit of faith, the revelation received from the apostles through the church. Again, Paul to Timothy, guard the good treasure entrusted to you. Wonderful words. Bishops, therefore, have the duty of guaranteeing that Catholics receive basically the real thing, the same good news preached to the apostles and the first Christian communities, and that they don't receive some diluted or twisted gospel simply adapted to the age in which they are living. Episcopal authority, therefore, has a decidedly conservative side. Unlike the apostles who were direct recipients of the revelation, the bishops are to preserve the deposit of faith and to expound it faithfully. When questions arise about what is authentic Catholic doctrine, whether about the early church's disputes over the Trinity the divinity of Christ, the meaning of original sin or justification, the number of the sacraments, and so on. It falls to the bishops, always with the Pope as the Bishop of Rome, to distinguish true from false teaching. As a collegial body, they have this responsi responsibility, though the Pope, as head of this college, can on occasion exercise uh, this apostolic authority on his own. We'll talk more about that. But it's really, the, the idea is to see that the, the authority is entrusted to a collegial body, which succeeds to the apostolic body. The original body had Peter with the other apostles. The uh, church today has the successor of Peter and the other bishops, other bishops, everyone is a bishop. As Vatican II admonished, the bishops 
must also reliably interpret the meaning and demands of the gospel, this is to Scott's point that he mentioned, for the people of today. And again, I cite from the, the specific doc document, Christus Dominus, which is written on, on bishops. It, said, it writes, the bishops should present Christian doctrine in a manner adapted to the needs of the times. That is to say, in a manner corresponding to the difficulties and problems by which people are most vexatiously burdened and troubled. It's a nice word of vexatiously. Now, I'd like to say something specifically because questions often, they usually come up about the teaching authority of the Pope, what is called the papal magisterium. The Bishop of Rome, the Pope, is the only bishop who succeeds to a particular bishop uh, of the original apostolic college of the Twelve. Everyone else succeeds just generically as a body to a body. The Pope, however, succeeds in Catholic teaching specifically to the role that Peter held in the original apostolic college. The other bishops succeed simply to the, to the body. It's a body to body. Peter is different. He alone, therefore, among all the bishops, has a unique and specific teaching role one that is often referred to as the ordinary papal magisterium. His everyday teaching is very different from my everyday teaching or Cardinal X's uh, everyday teaching. It's only the pope who has this special role. Nobody else, archbishops, cardinals, no. It's, it's, it's specifically the successor of Peter. And as a, an essential feature of this Petrine office, or the office of Peter, the Pope's ordinary magisterium enjoys its own specific charism or gift, for he is the one upon whom the Lord chose to build his church, the one for whom the Lord prayed at the Last Supper that his faith, faith would not fail, the one to whom the Lord confided the uh, care of the sheep. And so the Pope is the preeminent teacher for all Catholics at all times and everywhere. He enjoys what is referred to as supreme authority in the church. It's clear from the dogmatic teaching of the First Vatican Council. It's not a theological opinion. And he does so, we're talking about his authority to teach even when he is not teaching, and we'll get into this, in the most solemn way, ex cathedra, which is very rare. The Pope ordinarily teaches through what is called his ordinary everyday uh, magisterium. Examples of the ordinary magisterium, of course, include, you know, well, even recently you would, would say the, his encyclical Laudato Si would be an exercise of the, of the ordinary magisterium. Uh, um, the encyclical of Benedict XVI, Day of the, uh, God is Love, Deus Caritas Est. These are typical examples of the way the Pope is, is teaching. He teaches less formally, more formally, but still ordinarily. And I'll get into then how do we receive this teaching. That's, that's the next part, but just to see how he does it, when he does it. <clears throat> and because the gospel inspires and guides the whole sphere of human behavior, particularly critical today is the Pope's responsibility to teach on matters of morals and on matters of, in the developing social tradition, uh, social doctrine of the church. There is today less specific concern about matters of doctrine. We are not in, in the throes in the Christian world about debates over the Trinity or the divinity of Christ or the real presence in the Eucharist. These are um, defined in Catholic life. He also, I mean, and a lot of these questions, what are these questions that have arisen, particularly in the moral area? All the questions around uh, in vitro uh, um, fertilization, euthanasia, innumerable bioethical problems, the death penalty, Lots of these questions are dealt with in the churches, in the Pope's ordinary magisterium. Even the promulgation of the catechism of the Catholic Church 
is an act of the ordinary magisterium of the Roman pontiff, prepared, of course, by others, but promulgated and made a catechism by, because this is part of the, of, of the Pope's ordinary teaching. Within the catechism, of course, there are things that are defined and so on, but how the catechism is to be accepted is, a, is an act of the papal magisterium. Nonetheless, and, and Pope Francis is, in his first encyclical made an interesting point. He said, I do not believe that the papal magisterium should be expected to offer a definitive or complete word on every question which affects the church and the world. In other words, it's not, the papal magisterium is not an oracle. It's not sort of plug it in and get an answer to every question. However, when theological debate goes out of the bounds of orthodoxy and threatens the unity of faith, the Pope can intervene. He has the right to intervene and declare that certain views are contrary to the church's faith. Some might even say that he should intervene in certain instances. That would be perhaps the case today on the, the whole question of the synodal way in Germany, although he did, he did write a stern letter. He has the authority to intervene, but prudential judgment determines in specific cases whether he does so or not. And it's prudential judgment. We're often, because not all of these things, um, oh, we'll see when we get to reception. When he does this, the Pope is defending the right of the people of God to receive the message of the church in its purity and integrity and to be free from being disturbed by a particularly dangerous opinion. And so, without appealing to the charism, and I'll talk about this in a minute, of teaching infallibly, without error, the Pope, just using his ordinary teaching authority, he can confirm or declare doctrines that are already held by all the bishops and the church. He can, in a sense, bring them to a higher level of formality. He did this very clearly in the encyclical um, on life, Evangelium Vitae, when he said this. But what he's doing is he, he's not, this is not an ex cathedra proclamation. He's taking what is the belief of the church and just making it all the more clear this is what he wrote in Evangelium Vitae. Many of you know that. By the authority which Christ conferred upon Peter and his successors, and in communion with the bishops of the Catholic Church, I confirm that the direct and voluntary killing of an innocent human being is always grave, gravely immoral. This doctrine based upon the unwritten law which man in the light of reason finds in his own heart, is reaffirmed by sacred scripture, transmitted by the tradition of the church, and taught by the ordinary magisterium. So what he's doing is taking what is a, uh, all the bishops really held this view. He's just making sure, and he can, he's confirming what is already believed, what is already believed. He did this also, and this was very important in his a statement in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis on the ordination, can women be admitted to the, to the uh, priesthood, which had been the constant tradition of the Catholic Church, really beginning only in probably the 1970s, questions arose. And he, this is how he phrased it. This is when he, again, is confirming what is, in fact, the belief of the body of bishops, and he wrote this. Wherefore, in order that all doubt may be removed regarding a matter of great importance, a matter which pertains to the church's divine constitution itself. And then this is the formula. In virtue of my ministry of confirming the brethren, I declare that the church has no authority whatsoever to confer priestly ordination on women and that this judgment, and here are important words, is to be definitively held by all the church's faithful. Remember this phrase, 
is to be definitively held by all the church's faithful. This sets us up now for um, the beginning of, of a discussion of infallibility. Catholics certainly believe that the church, by Christ's commission, will remain in existence, faithful to the gospel, until the end of time. By the Lord's promise, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And in order to preserve the church and the purity of the faith handed on to us by the apostles, Christ has conferred upon the church, especially upon those who have apostolic authority in the church, a share in his own infallibility. In other words, his teaching without error. Christ did not teach error. This gift of teaching without error expresses the church's supreme degree of participation in the authority of Christ. In other words, the church shares in the authority of Christ, the church as a whole in its, in its believing, but in its, in its teaching, entrusted to the body of bishops with the head, uh, the pope. And on occasion then, the church doesn't just have an ordinary magisterium, sort of every day, but there is the gift of infallibility, which I assume most of you are familiar with. It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean sinlessness. It does, has nothing to do with, with, with moral perfection. It has to do with the degree of certitude that attaches when a certain doctrine is proposed for belief. It's not a personal quality of, of the thing. The charism of infallibility, and we use the term charism because it is, a, it is a specific gift of the spirit, defined, this is all defined doctrine from Vatican I. This charism is infallibility that the church has received from the Lord simply means that when she solemnly proposes to the faithful something as either, either divinely revealed or definitively to be held, which was the term we saw in Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. If it's a matter of faith or morals, that this cannot be erroneous, even though the, te the teaching might be inadequately expressed. It doesn't mean it's perfectly formulated, as time, you know, the meaning of words can change, etc. But it cannot be erroneous. It might very well be that at a later date, such irreformable, and we use the term irreformable as kind of um, synonymous with infallible. It can't be. It's not going to be, you, we're not going to wake up in the morning and find out, for example, what's an infallible teaching. One, the mystery of Christ. Christ is a divine person with a human and a divine nature. We're never going to say, no, that's wrong. He really only has he really only has a divine nature. There was no human nature. That's just not going to happen. We're not going to, something declared by the Pope solemnly, the doctrine of the assumption. We're not going to read, oh, the church has decided, no, Mary didn't really, wasn't really assumed into heaven. That's just a, a pious belief that can be discarded as time goes by. The charism of infallibility guarantees that those, that that will not happen, cannot happen. It's a gift, we believe, certainly from God. And from the apostolic age onwards, Christians have been convinced that Jesus is with us, that he, is, that he has sent us the spirit of truth from his Father, that the spirit uh, leads the believing community into all truth. And again, to cite Tim Timothy, that the church of the living God is the pillar and the bulwark of the truth. Now the question, who, who can... Who can teach infallibly? Who can teach in such a way that this teaching is uh, without error? That we have the certainty that it, it is um, irreformable. It rests upon the College of Bishops as a body, together, and it can also be exercised by the Pope by himself as head of the College. It, it's a gift to the College of apostles, it's a gift to the successors of the apostles. Therefore, who can teach infallibly? 
there are really in three, dis there are three distinct who's or answers to this. The first is bishops in an ecumenical council. The second is bishops spread throughout the world outside of an ecumenical council. And the third way, of course, is when the Pope teaches something, as we'll see, ex cathedra, from the chair. Let's look at each of these. On 21 different occasions in the church's history, and most recently at the Second Vatican Council, large gatherings of bishops from around the world, every bishop is invited, together always with the Bishop of Rome. There's no council without the approval of the Bishop of Rome. They've come together to deal with major doctrinal, disciplinary, and pastoral questions that affect not just a part of the church, but the universal church. Vatican II was really more concerned with pastoral questions, although there are certainly some dogmatic statements that it made that are to be definitively held. Unlike some earlier councils, though, where there were very clear um, doctrinal statements, you know, that there is, uh, oh, there is a divine person of, and Christ has a human and a divine nature uh, on the subjects of there are seven sacraments, no more, no less, that the Eucharist is the, the real presence of Christ and so on. But these, ex these uh, assemblies are extraordinary moments in the life of the church. 21 in 20 centuries, I mean, gives us about one a century. There was one in the 16th century, there was one in the 19th century, one in the 20th century. You know, there very well might be one in the 21st century. Who knows? We don't know that. I certainly don't. But usually they were called to uh, resolve serious disputes. One of the great documents of, of the Council of Nicaea, of course, is the, is the creed that we recite on Sunday, which was added to later at Constantinople. This gathered assembly can, of course, once again, with the approval of the Pope, can make statements which um, are to be held um, as revealed. Catholics believe it's revealed. We'll see in that we give the assent of faith. And it's very clear in, in the statements that the council makes what it is that they want, that they're proposing. It's, you just can't read sort of the whole, take a history and read the whole thing. They always say things like, the Holy Council believes and confesses, or if anyone does not confess X, Y, or Z, then that person is anathema, which means outside the communion of the church. Um, Ecumenical councils, the, f the first four ecumenical councils are widely held by all Christians as, as proposing, particularly the creeds, because they contain the creeds, uh, as um, teaching infallibly. Even if that vocabulary is not, is not used, it, they accept that, there is, that this is true teaching, doesn't contain error. Secondly, and this is uh, a little more, um, is not quite as clear cut, and that's bishops in their teaching, then they're united in the profession of a, of a teaching, but they're not in a council. This is um, often referred to in theological terms as the ordinary and universal magisterium of the bishops. And when I say of the bishops, it's always, always with the Bishop of Rome. And there is a, a very important statement in the, one of the great documents of the Second Vatican Council, Lumen Gentium number 25, which is key to all of this. And I, I'd like to read it to you. It says, although individual bishops, like me, do not enjoy the prerogative of infallibility, only the Pope as an individual bishop does, but the rest don't. Then it goes on. They do, nevertheless, enunciate the doctrine of Christ. So it always has to be a matter of faith or morals. The doctrine of Christ infallibly. They can do this infallibly when, even when dispersed around the world, not coming together in a synod or a council, but preserving the bond of communion between themselves and with the successor of Peter, 
united with Peter and among themselves, when they concur on one judgment as something to be held definitively while authentically teaching on matters of faith and morals and so that they can propose something to be held definitively. This is actually, it, it, it sounds esoteric, it's what happens all the time. This is, um, it's a normal means. Um, think, of, think of doctrines that have never been defined by the Pope, never been taught by an ecumenical council specifically, and yet are part of the patrimony of Catholic um, belief. Um, a lot of the teachings on Mary, Mary's perpetual virginity, for example, never defined by anyone. There's an, there's an agreement among, among bishops, uh, and this, how would you say, how do you know this, uh, with the Pope? It's shown in, in liturgical expressions. It's, in, it's in just repeated in the, con in the constant teaching of the church. It's never, it's, nobody's ever bothered to define it because it, it, hasn't, it hasn't been contested among, among Catholics and so on. That's the universal and ordinary magisterium. But what it proposes, it doesn't propose things from divine revelation that are to be held by faith. It only proposes what can be definitively held. The third category is the one that usually gets the most attention, and that's the Pope speaking ex cathedra from the chair, the cathedra like cathedral is the, is, is the chair, the, the chair of Peter. This was defined at the Vatican Council in 1870 and of course repeated uh, in the documents of the Second Vatican Council and referred to fairly frequently in other documents of the magisterium. Um, It goes like this. It means that a papal definition is not true because the Pope teaches it. It's not true because the Pope teaches it. It's the opposite. He teaches it because it is true. What changes when a teaching is proclaimed infallibly is the degree of certitude that we have regarding what is proposed. It doesn't the Pope cannot make something true. That would be silly. And there are very specific conditions that are laid out so that we know that this, that this teaching, that the Pope is in fact teaching something from the chair. He has to do so specifically not as a private theologian, but as the teacher of, the preeminent teacher in the church he has to put the weight of his entire ministry behind it. And he, the formulations will always say something invoking the authority of the Apostle Peter and usually Paul. Papal infallibility is not because a, a line of popes have held this view. It's a charism that attaches specifically to the pronouncement of a specific pope. It, it, you can't just kind of say it, that would be the, in the church's ordinary teaching. But it doesn't, the Pope, that's not an ex cathedra statement. He has to have a genuine intention to define something. Often Popes say lots of things, they don't have any intention of defining anything. And the most important one really, it has to be obvious to the church that he is doing so. This is where, of course, in a lot of these, there is a certain amount of theological debate. Now to the question of how do Catholics respond to the, teaching, the, the teachings of the magisterium? How are we? What kind of reception or assent do we give? Does it make any difference who the teacher is? Does it make any difference what is taught or how it is proposed? First a word about docility. Um, it's not always easy for people to accept the church's teaching authority especially if it runs contrary to what a person instinctively holds. They can hold a lot of things, but um, there are some tough issues for people. Um, we're not used to being told what to do, even though that's not really the, 
what the magisterium does, but it does propose for the faith, the acceptance of the faithful, adherence to that. Um, we live in a world, though, where thinking for yourself, judging for yourself, um, standing up for what you believe are uh, supreme values almost. We live in a world where my truth is as good as yours. Um, and we hear that all the time on uh, the media. There's an innate suspicion of truth to begin with. Uh, phrases like dictatorship of, uh, the dictatorship of relativism and so on. Uh, a lot of people think that adult, so-called adult Catholics, um, the virtue of obedience is um, shunned. Um, Catholics should show and traditionally have shown, this is breaking a little in the, curtain, in the modern age, um, a fundamental docility to the church's teaching. In any case, I think it is impossible to be a so-called good Catholic and not be docile. Now, there are ways in which um, this is not servility, but a basic respect and docility for the magisterium is expected. Uh, that's, that's simply, I think, an innate Catholic virtue and required because to, to do this would be is to, frankly, implicitly deny the authority given uh, to, the, um, to the Episcopal College by, uh, by the Lord. This doesn't, and we'll see, there, there are some things. But there are different responses to different ways in which the magisterium proposes a teaching. And we need to, di to distinguish those because it makes, it makes, um, makes a difference. The first is rather simple, at least in terms of defining. And this is that Catholics owe the obedience of the act of faith, the obe what St. Paul calls the obedience of faith, to teachings that are proposed as divinely revealed, that those call forth for the ascent of faith. And the opposite of that, it's, it's to submit to the teaching on the basis that God has revealed this. And to uh, deny such teaching in a public way is formally heresy. That's what heresy is. It's the denial of something which is taught as divinely revealed. Who Christ is, that there are three persons in one God, etc. To deny those is, 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 is heresy, and that separates a person from the communion of the church. We, unfortunately, today, the word is thrown around in a much less precise way. When people say such and such, a, such, and such a teaching is heretical, and it's not a teaching that is, that is proposed, it's divinely revealed. But what about those teachings that are to be held definitively? like the teaching that I, I read from Ordinatio Sacerdotalis. There's no contention that this is revealed in Scripture. John Paul II did not say that the teaching forbidding women from the ministry is dealt with in Scripture. He's not saying that this is divinely revealed. He's saying the fact that only men have, been, have, have received the order is what brings us to this conclusion. But he can't claim that it is divinely revealed. Nonetheless, as, as was said, it is to be definitively held because it is true. The opposite of this, however, is error. It is not heresy. And it becomes, these, these are become very important terms for canonical reasons and so on. Um, so that something can be See, to be divinely revealed has to be clear in the foundation of revelation. But that there can be, for example, the teaching on contraception. There's nothing in the New Testament or in the early word of God about contraception. There's a lot about who the human person is, the dignity of the human person. Nonetheless, in Humanae Vitae, that is teaching to be definitively held. But it's not divinely revealed. One has to be really you have to be really careful with uh, the terms. 
Um, when we make a profession of faith, when a priest makes his profession of faith or a deacon before ordination, there's the recitation of the creed. Then there's, there are add-ons. And the first add-on is, I mean, you say, I, with firm faith, I, you begin it, with firm faith, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. Then it says, I, I um, accept and hold what the church definitively teaches. See, there, there's, there, are, there are important uh, distinctions. I firmly accept and hold. It is not asking for the, for the assent of faith. I don't believe it because it's divinely revealed. I believe it fundamentally on the authority of the church. The trickiest problems are the responses to the ordinary magisteria, things that are not proposed had to be held um, uh, as uh, irreformable. And it's really the ordinary magisterium of the Pope. That's the one that, uh, because he teaches the universal church. Um, what response do we give to the ordinary magisterium of the Pope? When he's not claiming that he's teaching irreformably. Obviously, when he teaches, and this is where it becomes, he's invoking often the tradition of the church and scriptures, but it's not because he's saying this time, he's, he's simply repeating the general ch church's teaching. But when he teaches something, for example, the recent alter, uh, the, the uh, alteration of the catechism, where fundamentally Pope Francis says that there's really no reason why that can justify capital punishment, which is a change in the ordinary teaching of the church. He is not imposing that as, a, as something uh, that he's teaching ex cathedra. He's proposing as part of the ordinary magisterium to which a Catholic owes respect, but not, does not demand absolute adherence the way something that is proposed infallibly or something that is proposed as requiring the response of faith. This, you know, this becomes, and this is where there's often a lot of um, disagreement because some, some, some of these things are not in practice absolutely clear. It is more than the Pope's opinion on a certain matter. And his opinion is not just one opinion among many, but it is still, it is, it is still proposed as, as something that is possibly reformable. We accept um, teachings like this all the time. Every time you go to a doctor and he tells you what's wrong with you and stuff, uh, we, we accept things uh, on you know, the authority of the person. It's not, it's not but it is non-definitive. And we can't pretend that it is, we can't depend that it is definitive. What becomes kind of tough is where in the great scheme of things does a particular teaching lie? And to be honest, the questions are usually over moral questions where this arises. Teachings on the natural law, it's not usually doctrinal, doctrinal questions. Um, it would, uh, and um, uh, I wish there's, you know, and there are no lists of things that, that, that make everything sort of uh, uh, perfectly clear. What about, you know, the, the church's teaching on a just war? Where does that, where does that fall into, into things? What about all the questions now arising in genetics? You know? Some, some w w will be able to be say or to be definitively held. Some might just be in the ordinary magisterium. Some things are not yet clear. Um, there's a certain degree of, 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 of complexity in this. The simpler ones are actually um, the Pope teaching ex cathedra when he did in 1950 the declaration of the, of the dogma of the assumption. That's clear cut, um, but we often don't get such clear cut. Um, I hope that you at least have a, 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 a sense of 
in many ways, the gift uh, to the church of uh, being able to assure through time the uh, original revelation of Jesus Christ, that the gospel, which is the word of God, uh, written and unwritten, that, this, that the gospel is, has remained incorrupt. But there are questions that the gospel does not direct, directly address that have come up in time and through time. Those are the ones that the teaching of the church uh, with the help of the Holy Spirit, that, that those mature through time. They weren't asked at the time of the original revelation. And yet the questions are asked and there are clarifications that need to be made. Coming, of course, using the original sources. That's what, where the work of theology, time, and so on uh, become so important. Now, I think it's time if anyone has any questions that they would like to ask.